Good evening. It's October 18th, 2013. My name is Matthew Ogden, and I'd like to welcome you to our weekly broadcast of the LaRouche Pack live webcast featuring Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Uh, we will proceed according to our usual format tonight. Uh, there will be a series of questions uh, which Mr. LaRouche will have an opportunity to respond to. I'm joined in the studio by Dennis Mason, who will be joining me in posing those questions. We are going to begin with a question which has come in from a source in Washington, D.C. And I'm just going to read the question as written. Mr. LaRouche, as of October 1st, the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, has been launched with a well-known series of computer glitches and other serious problems. On a much more profound level, you were one of the earliest and harshest critics of Obamacare, even equating it with Hitler's 1939 T4 euthanasia program. Much of the recent debate around Obamacare has been muddled by Tea Party Republicans, the government shutdown, and the fight over the debt ceiling. The New York Times has recently published three articles exposing the fact that some of the most vulnerable Americans, including the working poor and single parent households, will be shut out of the health care system altogether. Can you please take us through your critique of Obamacare in the context of the larger economic policies of the Obama presidency? What do these policies represent? What are your alternatives? Clearly, many of the most vocal and informed critics of Obamacare share very little with the Tea Party critics, and in fact advocate a far more serious change in our entire health care delivery system. Well, the question has two parts. The first part is, is entirely correct, as far as I understand. That's clear. Those are the facts. But what, what's different is the question about the Obamacare system. Now, the charges made are plausible, but they don't go to the root of the matter. What this is, is the Queen of England, in her policy and the policy of her Dutch allies or partners, has actually decreed a campaign of genocide whose stated intention is to reduce the population of the planet Earth from 7 billion persons to less than one. This program is now ongoing. Not only is this the ongoing program, but this is precisely the program doctored by Queen Elizabeth and adopted from the beginning of his presidency by this, this character, Obama. So Obama is actually an instrument of genocide placed in government with the aid of a lot of drug money from the British to back his career, especially as near the Texan, Texas border huh? and so forth. And this bum has been committed to that policy of genocide specified internationally by the Queen of England and her Dutch accomplices. This problem, program is now fully in effect in effect, and has been in effect since actually the beginning of the George W. Bush administration. That has been the policy. It is also implicitly the policy of the Bush family. Since the uh, Prescott Bush, who was the actual guy who bailed Hitler out and made Hitler uh, the dictator of Europe, essentially, was done by, by the same group. So both of these factors, the Bush family, from Prescott Bush, H.W. Bush, and Little Bush are all samples of this problem. So what we're dealing with, we're dealing with an international, glo effectively global, but which has t already taken out, virtually taken out. The nations of continental Europe have virtually in the process of disappearing under a program which amounts already to genocide. What this means for the United States, if Keeping Obama in the presidency is condoning genocide. He should be thrown out of office now in the proper procedure, get him out of there, 
So at the point we can save a lot of human lives. Now you look at the condition of the lives of people in the southern states, the children in southern states. Look at the other results of the Obama policy as specific. Then look back and say, where did this come from? Did it, how did Obama do all this? How is he such a power and influence that he could do this together with the, with the British Queen and the, and the uh, Dutch nonsense? That's what this is. The policy is one of genocide. In, in terms of history, you would say the genocide in uh, Tyre, uh, not Tyre, but in, uh, in, the, in the Greece, the Greece. Yeah. That, that same genocide is the policy now being pushed. And there is only one answer. And no matter how much people wiggle about this thing, there is no possibility of preventing genocide in the United States as long as Obama is permitted to remain president. There is no compromise possible on this issue. Well, let me ask a follow-up question on that and give some very significant background, which I think is important for people to know. Uh, let me just start by saying on June 24th, 2009, uh, the LaRouche movement submitted testimony to the United States Congress titled, Why the Obama Health Plan Must Be Scrapped. That written testimony began by saying, we have determined that the fundamental premises of this program, as represented by OMB Chief Peter Orzag, his health advisor Ezekiel Manuel, and the president himself are identical to those which underlay the genocidal program for eliminating the unrehabilitatable sick in the Hitler regime. There can be no compromise with the premises of this program. If it is successful, it will lead to genocide, and not only in health care, since OMB chief Orzag has already announced that after health care, he intends to reform, i.e. slash, Social Security. Next. Uh, the testimony goes on to cite the origins of Hitler's genocide program, which started with a memo written by Hitler personally on October of 1939, titled, The Destruction of Lives Unworthy of Life, in which he declares that Reichsleiter Berler and Dr. Brandt are charged with the responsibility for expanding the authority of physicians to be designated by name to the end that patients considered incurable according to the best available human judgment of their state of health can be accorded a mercy death. And as a result of that memo, a working group for sanit sanatoriums and nursing homes was set up at 4 Tiergartenstrasse in Berlin. And they prepared a questionnaire to categorize the specific individuals who would be targeted for these so-called mercy deaths. The four categories were, one, patients who suffered from diseases which rendered them unemployable, including schizophrenia, epilepsy, senility, paralysis, feeble-mindedness, and the like. Two, patients who had been institutionalized for at least five years. Three, patients who are criminally insane. And four, non-Germans. According to this questionnaire, um, which was circulated to all the hospitals in Germany, an independent board of experts then reviewed each case and put a dash mark or an X signifying whether the patient lived or died. Uh, now, Dr. Leo Alexander, who was the chief medical advisor to the United States Chief Counsel for War Crimes during the Nazi doctors trial in the Nuremberg Tribunals, wrote the following in the New England Journal of Medicine after the Nuremberg trials concluded. He said, whatever proportions these crimes finally assumed, it became evident to all who investigated them that they had started 
from small beginnings. The beginnings at first were merely a subtle shift in emphasis in the basic attitude of the physicians. It started with the acceptance of the attitude, uh, which is basic in the euthanasia movement, that there is such a thing as a life not worthy to be lived. This attitude in its early stages concerned itself merely with the severely and chronically sick. Gradually, the sphere of those to be included in this category was enlarged to encompass the socially unproductive, the ideologically unwanted, and finally, all non-Aryans. But it is important to realize that the infinitely small wedge-in lever from which this entire trend of mind received its impetus was the attitude towards the non-rehabilitatable sick. Now, Lynn, when you first identified Obamacare as a carbon copy of Hitler's T4 back in 2009 and put the Hitler mustache on Obama, leading Democrats went hysterical and screamed that your warnings were extreme, were over the top. But just this past week, um, we've received reports that there's been a sudden change in attitude among certain layers of the Democratic Party leadership who are now beginning to realize that you were right all along and that your warnings about the killer fascist tendency of this president are now being proven totally correct. So in light of that change, I wanted to invite you to elaborate on this in the context that we find ourselves in now. What we have is a global phenomenon, this horror show, which has destroyed the nations of Western and Central Europe already. They no longer have freedom, any freedom to speak of, so to speak. They're under management by the joint Dutch-British imperial system. And the whole set, that whole center of Europe, central part of Europe, is now being butchered, plainly butchered. The thing is now being spread in terms of the Obama administration's role in the attempt to start a war against China. And this is very serious, an attempted war against China, where Korea refused to deal with Obama's administration on the basis of this, that they would not tolerate this attempt to start a war using Korea against China. So we're in the same kind of thing now. And on top of that, there is no possibility now, as long as Obama is not removed from office for cause, for cause, elementary cause, if he's not removed from office, then those who do not work to remove him from office are guilty. They're guilty of the same crime as Adolf Hitler because they condone it, because that's what the danger was with the Germans. The German, the German people began to give, give in to Hitler. They're giving in to Hitler even before the war it was the same kind of crime. It was a crime against humanity, which had already started in, in 1939, openly. And it was backed by Prescott Bush, who was the person the, who first intervened to allow Hitler to become the Chancellor of Germany and who in effect made him and supported him together with other pro-Nazi people in the British system and in the, the Bush family system too. So the Bush family since that time, including George H.W. Bush, including Bush Bush, that, and this operation is the same criminal tendency, it, but in, in a more or less diluted form or disguised form. But that's what the policy is. And the Bush family's role in this is prominent all the way through. It is a Bush family problem, especially the family of Prescott Bush. And that's the problem. Can, do, do we in the United States have a sense of honor which refuses to deal justly with our own people for the sake of 
giving uh, opportunities to the Bush, that Bush family. Now, and also remember, there's another crime. 9-11. 9-11, even though they have all these special protocols around to try to deny the truth, 9-11 was a product of the British monarchy, the Saudi kingdom, eh? including the leading Saudi figure right now, who's, who is involved in that. They did 9-11. And then the Bush family eh, went ahead and pu pushed through a cover-up of 9-11, when in point of fact it was the Saudi leader who, who had been at that point was the ambassador to the United States. This Saudi leader personally is involved in setting up 9-11, personally. And he's now the head of the, um, still ahead of the Gulf Arabia, Arabian system. So that's what the problem is. Therefore, you see, what you see is a stink of corruption permeating our own institutions of government through these mechanisms. And the time has come we will not save the United States. And anyone who does not move to move these guys out is actually condoning, implicitly condoning, treason against the United States, treason against the human species as well. Because the intention here is global. We have now 7 billion people on this planet, estimated. And the Queen of England, together with her Dutch accomplices, has set forth a policy for reduction of the human population as rapidly as possible from 7 billion people to one or less. That is the policy of the Queen of England. That is the policy of the Dutch system. The Dutch were actually much ahead of their uh, British cousins in terms of this kind of genocide. And that's where we stand. We are at the point where anyone who raises funny questions about my charges against Obama and his predecessors and the Bushes is wrong. And their wrongness in the fact that they have influ great influence in the nation means that their wrongness, it borders into clearly criminal intentions. Lynn, yesterday you appeared on the Alex Jones show and gave an interview there um, in which you unequivocally stated exactly what you've stated tonight, that the time has come for the immediate removal from office of Barack Obama. What you said there was that Obama has to be thrown out of office immediately, and there's every reason to do so preemptively, not only for his sake, but for the sake of the people of the United States. And you said if his policies, as he just put the new stages into operation, if that policy is allowed, you're going to see open Hitler-style genocide applied to a large section of the U.S. population who are considered not fit to survive, not fit to live, just like Hitler, lives unworthy to be lived. And in that interview, you said that across the nation, we're seeing an explosion in this determination, what you called a rising tide of determination to throw this guy out of office. Uh, that's the mood out there, and it's increasing at a rapid rate. Now, I just wanted to cite two examples of that. First of all, earlier this week, a very high-level elected official, the lieutenant governor of Texas, a man named David Dewhurst, surprised a lot of people by openly calling for Obama's impeachment. Uh, he said uh, he had a number of reasons which, uh, which rose to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Obama's blatant disregard for federal law, including ignoring federal drug laws, um, stating his open intention to work around the United States Congress in violation of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, but what Dewhurst said he was most concerned about is Benghazi. And he said all the national news reported that there was a live video stream into the White House Situation Room. And not mobilizing some response 
to protect the ambassador and those three Americans is just outrageous to me. He said, that happens to be my view, that the man has committed crimes that do not warrant his staying in office. Now, in addition to the lieutenant governor of Texas, we've also seen the somewhat popular radio show host Glenn Beck, who just recently joined in, finally, in calling for Obama's impeachment. And he said, for the very first time in my career, I personally am calling for the impeachment of the President of the United States. He's arming known terrorists in Syria. And if they are saying, we're going to arm Al-Qaeda, and yes, we know that these arms are going to fall into the hands of Al-Qaeda, Beck said, if that's not an impeachable offense, I don't know what an impeachable offense is. You're arming and aiding the enemies of the United States. I believe it is impeachable. I believe it is treason. And the president knows that it is against the law. So I think it's clear that there is indeed, as you said, Lynn, yesterday, a rising tide of determination in the United States to throw this president out of office. And what you said yesterday is that this is a president who's practically sitting there waiting for his own Nuremberg Tribunal. So you raise the question on the Alex Jones show, are we going to wait for a bloody dictatorship in this country, or are we going to mobilize to throw him out of office now? What, in your opinion, needs to be said to the people who are in the position to do that to happen immediately? There's a certain time where silence is speaks wonders because if any when you take the list of crimes which this president has committed against the United States and against the people of the world and the greater crimes he's trying to spread now for example what they trying to spread war against China which is already there the Korean pressure from the United States uh, on Korea the same way. So you see that this thing that's been done, the crushing and destruction of Western and Central Europe, the genocide, virtual genocide against Greece in particular, the threats against other nations, Spain, Portugal, and so forth, all coming from this same source of policy, the Queen and her Dutch relative. And who are, and by the way, these were the original sponsors, together with Bush, uh, Chet, uh, Bush uh, the Bush family. Prescott was a, was a key author. He not only did he support and defend Hitler and, in office, he did that. But his whole crew of allies did, in, from the inside the United States and Britain. The same thing has been going on again. They, they have destroyed the sovereignty of the nations of U Western and Central Europe. They have destroyed that sovereignty. And they, they, it started because the, a French uh, president, who was no damn good, actually, was a key in that instrument. But it was done by, whom? by George H.W. Bush, then a president of the United States, and then vice president as well in this zone, and that crew. They did it. So you've got the Bush family, which has a Hitler pedigree, to their grandfather, original grandfather, now Prescott Bush, a Hitler supporter. You'll find that all around all the people who the, that particular Wall Street interest was, were all the same thing. So the time has come that we're, the question is, are we going to have a human species? Now, there's one aspect of this thing you've got to take into mind. The level of warfare today is thermonuclear warfare. We have a number of nations who are on the target list of the Obama and his, his allies, which include Russia and China and possibly India and other countries. Any war which occurs among this circle of nations, of adversaries, would be a thermonuclear war. A thermonuclear war would be the probable extinction of the human species 
because merely going to the level of warfare and mobilization and weaponry to do that, to conduct such warfare successfully or supposedly would actually cause a re reactions throughout the planet which would be the extinction of the human species. There is no moral excuse. There's no justification in view of Obama's role in this complex and his advocacies in this complex. There is no basis in humanity for continuing to further uh, extend the presidency of the United States into the pause of Obama. I have uh, a question on the Korean, on South Korean situation, uh, which I'll read. Um, now, last night and uh, earlier in this broadcast, you commented that the decision by South Korea to reject Obama's uh, missile defense system, which would be aimed at China, uh, represents a development of strategic significance. Um, now, our source reports have, cons have confirmed that the South Korean government is refusing to deploy the U.S. high-altitude anti-missile systems and are accusing the United States of blackmailing them by threatening to reject South Korean requests to postpone the withdrawal of U.S. defense assistance by handing full wartime operational command over to South Korea unless the government of South Korea agrees to become part of Obama's ring around China encirclement strategy. South Korea is clear that the advanced missile defense systems that the United States is insisting be installed in South Korea are in no way meant to be a deterrent against North Korea. The low-tier Patriot missiles that South Korea already has are more than adequate for that. But rather that the United States high-altitude missile systems are intended to be targeted directly against China. Now, at the same time, it was reported this week that South Korea and Russia have revived talks on a proposed gas pipeline that would connect South Korea and Russia crossing through the territory of North Korea. These talks have been stalled for several months, but represent a significant component for the potential for peace in the region, as it would benefit all three nations, South Korea being the world's second largest natural gas importer, Russia being one of the world's largest exporter of natural gas, and North Korea sitting right in the middle, desperately in need of both the revenue and the jobs that this would, would provide. Now, China would also most likely be involved because uh, the relationship with North Korea would, it would attract large amounts of uh, Chinese investment into the, into the project. Now, on top of this, uh, Russia also reported yesterday that they had just opened a rail connection last month uh, between Kasan in Russia's southeast and the port of Rajin in North Korea. This connection represents a crucial portion of a possible rail connection all the way down to South Korea. And when President Putin met with South Korean President uh, Park at the G20 in Moscow, President Park told Putin, quote, I have personally dreamed of a railway that starts at Busan and reaches Europe via Russia. It is an important agenda item for my new government to strengthen Eurasian cooperation. So could you say more about the significance of these developments on the Korean Peninsula from your perspective and the context of this in the general Pacific development uh, orientation, uh, which you've been elaborating on? We have two key uh, star, starring issues on this agenda. First of all, the planet as a whole has been run down under these conditions, particularly since the, well, I would say immediately the collapse of the DDR, where the German government attempted to move in for an independent, reunited Germany. The French uh, president, through his representatives, and also the British uh, Queen, not the British Queen, but the British uh, head, of, head of government, and also personally George H. W. Bush moved in Europe to f put Germany under the control of a Euro system. Now, 
the, the, the Germany capitulated because the threat was war. And the French government in particular threatened war against Germany if Germany would try to uni reunite the German uh, nation. So that, this began the process of the entire sweeping destruction of the principal parts of Western Central Europe. This was also aimed against Russia. They thought they could control that thing a little more. Now it, it's come to the point that the entire planet is in a process of planetary breakdown. There are areas of the, of the planet where there's still some modality of functioning. But as of now, the human species in, in total is in danger. Initially, economically, and related kinds of things. These kinds of policy considerations. This is genocide in that way. It, but also, if you, anyone tries to push these nations together in a conflict, which is a, a thermonuclear conflict, you're talking about a war in the Pacific or centered in the Pacific, which blows away in about a, a, an hour and a half, wipes out the population of that area and continues to wipe out the population of the entire planet. That's what's in stake. And the madman, the cr criminal madman, such as the Queen of England and similar people are guilty of this crime. And there's no one who can honestly pre present an argument that this is not a crime in light of what it means. The very fact that the Queen has specified a policy of genocide and that the Dutch have the same kind of policy of genocide and their accomplices of the policy of genocide. So these people are there beyond the reach of morality. They're beyond the point that they could be entrusted with any kind of authority in any part of the planet. They, this element of government, wherever it exists, must be removed from government because we have reached the point where thermonuclear war is the typ typification of war, whether by a smaller group of nations or a larger one, makes no difference. The result of thermonuclear capabilities is extinction if they're used. Therefore, the very fact of the intentions of the Queen, the intentions of the Dutch government under the present king, and so forth, and some of the French who were complicit with this thing, this is something which is a crime against humanity in the highest sense. And in the, it, it is a, shall we say, most of these parties are Nuremberg criminals by virtue of precedent and have to be treated as such. We have to, we, we have to among other things, cure the evils that have been put upon us by these mispresidents and things like that. We have to restore growth real growth. We have to increase the energy flux density available to each individual to maintain their own lives, of nations to live their own lives and their own people. We will come to a point where because the very existence of thermonuclear war warfare is such that it's implicitly totally dis disturbing, that we have to therefore come to a new view of the role of man and man's nations, both on Earth itself and now implicitly beyond Earth. Mars will become, at some soon, time soon, if we are allowed to do that, Mars will become a, a, really a colony of Earth. Not, not in a in sense of recolonization, but there is no form of life known to us on Mars or to us, known to us in other planetary systems nearby which has human life on it, it interestingly on it unless somebody drops in for a visit. And therefore, we are at a point where we must reach a, a, a conception of the management of the solar system, working our way out from a core of nations into the larger. We have to defend these nations against all kinds of risks, asteroids and things of that nature. They are constant threats. So therefore, we have to have a management of the, and we think it's only Earth, we think that Earth, excluding Jupiter and Saturn and a few other things, there's no likely place where something like human life 
be found except on Earth and Mars, perhaps. And there, who knows what we can do on, on these things. So we come to the point that mankind on Earth is going to have to look around at its immediate neighbors, which means largely Mars, and it means a lot of large asteroids, which are, can be very useful to us if we can get them under control. So our, our responsibility is, is to create the circumstances in places like Mars and on some of these asteroids and so forth, where we can create something which creates safety for human life on Earth and also helps to develop the, the interior of the solar system, or a certain part of the solar system, in a way which leads, suggests that there's going to be a continuing future through progress throughout the solar system, at least for maybe the next billion years or so. And that's, that should be our immediate objective, and we hope that within a billion years maybe we could get some other problems solved as well. But they, we have to have that, that affirmative policy. that The human species is unique to, into our knowledge. And it's the, one of the most precious things in the whole solar system, as far as we know it. Because only mankind has the noetic capabilities of, of thought to be able to extend what we have on Earth in terms of human creativity. We have no other knowledge, no knowledge of anything like human. If, uh, there is nothing on Mars, nothing could be on Mars which would do that. And therefore, we, that's what we have to do. We have to say, now, war is out. You can no longer conduct war among nations because it leads to an automatic genocide. And therefore, we have to change our ways accordingly. We have to come to a new treaty, a new treaty which puts limits and control over the British system, over the Dutch system, and other systems which are violently pr prone against other, their people, other people. We have to bring up order. Yes, nation states we want, the, but the development of nation states is just as important as the existence of nation states. We have to take a pro-humanity policy, knowing that the human species is unique in its capabilities of creativity. And therefore, from our standpoint, the human species is, as a creative model, is sacred in principle. And that's, we have to come now to that accord. Yes, we want, it, we want the nations to be sovereign. Why? Because they have a culture. The sovereignty of the nation is part of a culture. The culture is a part of the ability of the nation to function, to work under a system of law, and to work under a system of cooperation, lawful cooperation among nations. That is precious to us. And the time has come to make a very important change. Get rid of the oligarchical system. Remove it from this planet. Go to sovereign nation states and their cooperation and their voluntary cooperation above all. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have a question that's come in from the uh, basement team, Benjamin Denniston of the basement team, um, on this particularly. Uh, on the, uh, the uh, asteroid program between the Department of Energy here in the United States and Rosatom in Russia. Um, I'll just read it as, as it is. He, sa he says, Lynn, there has been a flurry of interesting activity around the issue of asteroid defense and the possible prospects for a strategic defense of Earth program. Now, while not everything is totally clear yet, there is an interesting proposal for closer United States-Russian cooperation on asteroid defense, specifically involving cooperation between the nuclear laboratories of both nations, and I think it will be critical to get your thoughts on this. Uh, in September, at the International Atomic Energy Agency meeting in Vienna, an agreement between the United States and Russia was signed by the head of our Department of Energy and the head of Russia's nuclear, uh, nuclear agency, Rosatom. The legal agreement was titled Cooperation in Nuclear and Energy-Related Scientific Research and Development. The agreement is broad, covering fission and fusion power, among other excellent subjects. 
While the general attempt to open up closer cooperation between the nuclear labs of our two nations is itself significant, one of the possible areas of cooperation is the defense of Earth from asteroids, something you have been emphatically supporting in recent years. Um, now, almost just as interesting as the agreement itself was how quickly this specific asteroid defense issue was attacked in certain media outlets. According to the media coverage, the official 47-page agreement doesn't explicitly mention asteroid defense by name. However, in a short Department of Energy release on their website, they give very brief mention that one of the areas of cooperation between the United States and Russian, uh, Russian nuclear labs could be in defending Earth from asteroids. Uh, despite the little official public mention of the asteroid issue, there have already been at least two extensive slander pieces attempting to belittle the subject, spreading a lie claiming that this is the fantasy of a bunch of Dr. Strangelove-like fanatics who just want an excuse to play with nuclear bombs. Now, of clinical significance, these slander pieces by the Center for Public Integrity and ForeignPolicy.com include attacks on Dr. Uh, Dr. Teller for his work on asteroid defense, and even attacks on the Strategic Defense Initiative by name. All this is rather silly. In reality, the nuclear issue is relatively simple and it's obvious. It is a matter of energy flux density. If you have to deal with large objects, there is little, and, or if there is little warning time, nuclear power is the only thing that can do it. Now, with this discussion going on in the background, I would like to ask you about the bigger picture behind all of this. How can a strategic defense of Earth program define a new framework for mankind? Dr. Teller spoke of the Strategic Defense Initiative as organizing nations around the common aims of mankind. And he later got into the asteroid defense issue with the same intention, to unite the United States and Russia in collaboration in overcoming common challenges, common threats. The fundamental issue behind all this seems to be the big question. What is the true nature of the human species? What is the mission for the human species in this universe? And how can we define relations among nations from that understanding? Well, it's a mouthful to get into, but it's a useful mouthful. First of all, what is not discussed generally is what is the difference between the human mind, the human personality, and any other form of living process anywhere in the universe insofar as we know, insofar as we know. Well, the point is that the human being is the only known species of living species which is capable of actual creativity. No other species is capable of creativity. Now, the fact that some breeds breed differently and become different kinds of species as qualified is irrelevant. The point is because the human species is not only the superior species known to us throughout the universe. We don't know of any living creature in the universe so far. There probably are all over the place, but we don't know them. We are limited to our knowledge of the immediate solar system, which gets shadier and shadier as you go further and further from Earth and from the sun. So therefore, we, just, we have to say, what is our best knowledge? What is our best certain knowledge? And the best set knowledge is that you, the increase of energy flux density through the actions specific to the human species is the only basis for the continued existence of the human species. We know in all the animal kingdoms there is no species with any specific likeness in character to the human species. None. No animal species, living animal species, has that capability. It is unique to mankind. Now, there are a lot of stupid people who don't agree with me, but that's, what, that's why they are stupid people. <laughs> And they don't realize that the point is our concern is loyalty to the human species and its promotion, its development, its security. And what we do when we find different kinds of human species or varieties of human species, we're concerned that these species 
do not distract themselves from their true mission by getting into a wars with each other, avoidable wars in particular. That mankind has a mission inherent in, man, in mankind, which very few people on this planet today really understand. What we had is an approximation of that understanding was a certain religious belief in the sacredness of humanity, of human life. And we had religions which had that belief and had a practical understanding of that belief. And therefore we said, among such people, there must be permanent peace. There can be differences, there can be arguments, but there has to be cooperation. There has to be perfect peace. Now, we've gone through wars, terrible wars, and terrible kinds of genocide otherwise over the history of man. We would hope that mankind would, would suddenly realize what it is to be mankind, what that means, what the human species means in the, in the universe. We don't know of anything else but mankind as having these characteristics, uh, what, we, what we call mind, what we call creativity, what we call everything good about mankind. And these guys, what the enemy of mankind has always, from the inside of mankind, has always been what we call the oligarchical system. That what happens is some pe people, like those who conducted the genocide, uh, in, 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 um, anyway, that this kind of genocide at that war and other similar kinds of wars represented a kind of barbarism which is beneath humanity. Now what happened is most of the nations, national cultures of the world came under the control of cannibals or similar kinds of defective people who preyed upon each other, who lost all touch with the commonality of interest of humanity. The time has come that this must be realized. Now, what must be allowed in such a situation, yes, national sovereignty is a good, when it is practiced as a good. Differences in, the, in culture are tolerable and agreeable if we can learn to work together, that sort of thing. But what we're doing, what we're doing now, what makes the President of the United States, the current President, evil is his attachment to the Queen and to the Dutch and people, similar kinds of circles. That cannot be tolerated. That kind of, that tendency toward genocide cannot be tolerated. The, the other fact here is that we know a little bit about Mars. We have a, be able to peek at it occasionally and we have some other notions of these kinds of things. But as far as we know, mankind, as we know mankind on Earth, is the only species which has the noetic capabilities otherwise known to be specifically human. The human species is, to the best of our knowledge, the highest form of life existing on the pl in the universe. Huh? We don't know of anything better. We don't know anything to match that. And therefore our law, now the, the point of warfare, in terms of thermonuclear warfare, is so destructive. War cannot be used anymore, not as war. Maybe other police measures may be necessary, but not war. So the, the challenge now is, at this point, at a crucial point in, in history, in world history of mankind, we have to eliminate what we, maintaining the idea of the sovereign nation state. That is a necessary right to protect and, and defend. Culture, the, the, the idea of living within a particular culture among, within the human species, that's fine. That has to be protected. But the idea of use of warfare for oligarchical purposes and ambitions must now come to an end and come to one end with whatever force is necessary to bring this about. Let me ask a final question. On the topic of bringing an end to the oligarchical system, um, 
let me say first, because you've referenced it so many times, on the question of the Dutch. Um, I mean, when you look at the origin of modern genocide, you have to look at the Dutch. Um, you've repeatedly pointed to the um, invasion of England by William of Orange in 1688, uh, which was accompanied by his brutal wars on the continent against France, which was accompanied by his extermination of the Irish people, and also was accompanied by his crushing of the emerging Republic of Massachusetts Bay. Um, in 2002, the Dutch became the first country since Hitler's Germany to legalize euthanasia. They passed a law called the Termination of Life on Request and Assisted Suicide Act. And the bill set out conditions under which doctors could legally kill people or watch them commit suicide and permitted euthanasia for anyone aged 12 or older, merely stipulating that parental approval was needed for those between the ages of 12 and 16. Um, that bill was signed by Queen Beatrix, and uh, last year the Dutch even began allowing for the convenience of mobile vans to assist people who wanted to die in their own homes. Um, we also know that just last month the new Dutch king was uh, delivered his first throne speech in which he declared the end of the welfare state. Um, he stated that the so-called classic welfare state of the second half of the 20th century is now over. In other words, time to turn back the clock to Hitler. And henceforth, only a participation society was in effect. And medical care for the chronically ill, which is required to sustain life, uh, was going to be cut. And all of the national care that was provided for the elderly and sick must be devolved to the local level which is clearly a policy to decrease the quality of care and increase the death rate rapidly. Um, this policy was now directly echoed by President Barack Obama yesterday in his speech to the country um, in which he stated that uh, the, next, the next item on his agenda was cuts to Social Security and Medicare. He said it's the long-term obligations that we have around things like Medicare and Social Security that have to be dealt with now. Now, what I want to ask on this question and what you said on Alex Jones yesterday gets right to the point that Obama is nothing but a tool for this Anglo-Dutch genocide machine. Um, what we saw over the course of this government shutdown was that Obama was directly conspiring with Wall Street to uh, block Glass-Steagall and to insert a policy of bail-in and austerity. This week, um, we took out a unprecedented ad in The Hill, page 13 of the most widely read daily on Capitol Hill, called, We Stopped Obama's Unconstitutional War in Syria, Now Stop Obama's Wall Street War on the United States pass Glass-Steagall now. And this was signed by over 40 elected officials, labor leaders, community activists, radio show hosts, and others, many of whom I assume may be watching this broadcast tonight. So in light of that, I would like you to address what you've addressed tonight, the oligarchical principle stretching back thousands of years to the siege of Troy manifested in modern times by the Anglo-Dutch Empire, William of Orange, and now uh, uh, contained in the tool of this Anglo-Dutch genocide machine being Obama and Wall Street. How do you see the role of Glass-Steagall and the impeachment of Obama immediately in bringing an end once and for all to this oligarchical system? Well, first of all, I think it, it, it probably is a provable principle. I know it's provable in my terms of understanding, but I think it should be a universally accepted principle that what Obama represents is not 
a person is a person he's a personality not fit for any level of government, especially in national governments. The very fact of his policy and the mentality he expresses shows him as unfit to have been president or any other comparably significant rank of legislator or, or lawmaker or any judge, for example, who would had his policies should be thrown out of office for just those, for those reasons. And the, what we have, what we're looking at is looking at a phenomenon of e evil. It can only be called true evil. The other name for it is oligarchism, in which before a purely arbitrary selection of authority is imposed upon a people to make life and death choices through policy or personal action, personally chosen action, that must be really outlawed. It means that many aspects of government, of many governments, are polluted with the same sort of thing. Obviously, the ruling, the ruling uh, biological groups in Europe were murderers, they're criminals. Most of the ancestors of Europeans were criminals on this, on this basis. Crimes against humanity, the oligarchical system, the idea of Roman emperors, anything like that, because it was a system of brutal brutality. Knighthood was a system of brutality. It was not the rights of people and human beings as human beings were not recognized as that. As a matter of fact, we were all deprived by the degradation of human beings in any part of the world, the degradation of human beings to cannibalism, etc., etc. These things are crimes against humanity which must be stopped without, without any equivocation. But the problem is that the history of Europe in particular, and this comes up with the case of Nicholas Acuza, who recognized before his death, he recognized that the, it was impossible on the basis of his knowledge of history to produce a successful representation of human conditions under the present European cultures. And therefore, he prescribed to his associates and on behalf of the world as a whole, he said, we must not, we must get out of this system. This system of Europe cannot fit human need. It does not provide human justice. Therefore, he proposed that his associates must organize a campaign to grow across the great waters that divided continents hmm, and to establish a new kind of republic which would fit what he stood as Christian, sta Christian standards of behavior and development. He died before he had a chance to see that re result. But the result was produced by the followers of Cusa, who presented the case to a mariner, a, a great sea captain of that period already, Christopher Columbus. And Christopher Columbus organized on the, uh, with, under the flag of Cusa, really, what became the crossing of the, of the Atlantic. Not just the crossing of the Atlantic, that was being done otherwise under Cusa's influence during that period. But the one thing about Columbus's settlement was its purpose. It was not purpose of exploration, not purpose for exploration or, or ex exploitation, but to create a new nation free from the evils of Europe and, and other nations. And everything we have in the United States is, has to be traced exactly to that. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was a realization of that. Then it was crushed by the Dutch. Then we got it back in, in, in poorer form than we received it. Because you saw some of our presidents, presidents weren't so good when it came to performance. So that's, the point is, we, by our understanding of the origin of our nation, and the debt to Nicholas Acuza in making our nation possible gives us a moral requirement and performance which we think that any, any sane people on this planet would wish to share in.
So we must create a new kind of, of governmental system, a system of, of sovereign governments, which has a, a sense of what sovereignty should mean as our own constitution with all its imperfections attached to it. Huh? And that we must achieve that, that understanding. We must achieve also one thing that all these governments fail to recognize, human creativity. They take, talk about being nice to animals, human animals. Not nice in the sense of developing the, the powers of reason, the powers of creativity of the human individual, but simply imposing upon them reasonable uh, uh, supervision. And the time has come, we, we've got to go back to becoming, in the United States, we've got to become an A United States again, with no more Obamas or anything like him anywhere in it, and no more bushes. And we don't want to go into the question of burning. Well, on that note, I think uh, we've reached the appropriate place to bring a conclusion to our broadcast. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, please stay tuned because next week is going to be a very important week. Um, thank you for watching and good night. <laughs>